There's something else. Oxidation, folks. Oxidation provides energy. This is an oxidation reaction. The oxidation of this glyceraldehyde to the acid provides the energy necessary to add that phosphate. So oxidation provides the energy. In the, in the other reactions we saw, ATP provided the energy. Here the energy is coming from the oxidation of that aldehyde. Now, this guy here has a lot of energy. This guy here has energy. We're going to see later that it's going to donate those electrons to a system to make ATP. So we have, we've made two molecules that have a lot of energy. And the way that we were able to do that was thanks to oxidation. Oxidation made this possible. Now, I'm going to tell you something now that's not going to make a lot of sense now. You probably say, well, so what's new? All right. I'll tell you something that's not going to make a lot of sense right now, but I'm going to remind you of it later. Okay. Cells have limited amounts of NAD and NADH. If all they do is convert NAD into NADH, they run out of NAD. What happens if they run out of NAD in this reaction? The reaction is not going to go, right? So if the cells run out of NAD, this reaction is not going to go. And this turns out to be very critical. I want you to remember that because later I'm going to show you how cells recycle that. OK? Make sense? All right. So that's the only reaction, the only oxidation reaction of the um, of glycolysis. Here's a co-reaction. One three, oh by the way, it's called one three bisphosphoglycerate. You can call that one three BPG. Does that sound familiar? It's not the same BPG we talked about before, but you'll see why that's important in a minute. Okay? One three BPG. The one we talked about with respect to hemoglobin was called two three BPG. Right? Well, maybe you don't remember that, but I'll tell you that. Okay? Or maybe we just call it a BPG. In any event, this guy's called 1,3-BPG. 1,3-BPG has a lot of energy. It's able to use that energy to donate a phosphate to ADP and make ATP. That tells me that 1,3-BPG has more energy in it than, AT, than ADP does. So it's using its excess energy to donate that phosphate to ADP, making ATP. The product of that reaction is a molecule called 3-phosphoglycerate. You can call it 3-PG. Notice that this is another kinase, phosphoglycerate kinase. What's getting phosphorylated here? ADP is getting phosphorylated to become ATP, phosphoglycerate kinase. OK. By the way, this, uh, this uh, I should also point out, this, when, when students see this, they think, oh, well, now I know how ATP is made. Okay? There are a few reactions in the cell where ATP is made in a chemical reaction like this. Right? There's not a lot of them. There's not a lot of reactions where ATP is directly made. Okay? The ones where ATP is directly made have a name. There's a category of them. It's called substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation. This is a substrate. This is a phosphorylation. So the phosphorylation is occurring at the level of the substrate. There are three types of phosphorylation we'll talk about. We'll talk about all three of them. This is the first one. The second one's called oxidative phosphorylation. We'll talk about it with the mitochondria later on. So substrate level phosphorylation is the first one. Oxidative phosphorylation is the second. Yes? So we're a, OK, so I didn't give you a definition, but I'll tell you here. We're a high energy intermediate, donates a phosphate to ADP to make ATP. OK? Oxidative, I haven't defined. We'll define that later. 
but I'm just giving you the categories right now. The third type of phosphorylation that's important is what plants do with photosynthesis. It's called photophosphorylation. They're using the energy of the sun to make ATP. Photophosphorylation. All right, so those are the three different ways that we can make ATP in the cell. Substrate level, oxidative level, and uh, photophosphorylation. OK. Here's an interesting reaction. In this reaction, 3-phosphoglycerate is going to 2-phosphoglycerate. The enzyme that catalyzes this is called phosphoglyceromutase. And I don't have an, an abbreviation for that one. 2-phosphoglycerate, you can call 2-PG if you want. But this is called phosphoglyceromutase. This is an interesting enzyme. Mutase enzymes have very interesting properties. Okay? As you look at this reaction, if I said to you right now, I said, how does this enzyme work? I can tell you what you would tell me. You would say, well, the enzyme grabs the phosphate on position number three, and it moves it up to position number two, because that's what it looks like it does. And in summary, that's what it does. But that's not how it does it. How does it do it? A mutase works by starting with an intermediate where it puts a phosphate on to the place where it's going to be. So it starts with this guy, and it adds a second phosphate at position number two. So the intermediate in this process is known as 2,3-BPG. That is the one that we talked about before. The intermediate 2,3-BPG falls apart. The 3-phosphate three three comes off, and we're left behind with 2-PG. So You'll have phosphate hanging around. That's right. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is most enzymatic intermediates stay on the enzyme. They don't go anywhere. Not all of them. Mutases tend to let go of their intermediates. And that's very good for us because this mutase lets go of a little bit of the 2,3-BPG intermediate that it makes. The more glycolysis a cell is going through, the more 2,3-BPG the cell is letting go of. And what does the hemoglobin say? This cell is metabolizing rapidly. The only way you get much 2,3-BPG is that the cell is doing this reaction a lot. And if it's doing the reaction a lot, what does this cell need? It needs oxygen. It's a really cool scheme. It's a very cool scheme because now the cell uses this as the signal to know that it's going through glycolysis very rapidly. This is probably a muscle cell, and this muscle cell is doing its thing. And the signal for that is 2,3-BPG. 2,3-BPG binds to hemoglobin favors the release of oxygen, and allows that cell to continue doing what it does. Right down here first. Um, how does this tie into smoking? Okay, how does this tie into smoking uh, people need, uh, having more 2,3-BPG? Okay, When people smoke, okay, so if you remember from last time I said that one of the things that happens is people who smoke have more 2,3-BPG in their blood than people who don't. Okay. What I've just told you is that people who are going through metabolism very rapidly are making more 2,3-BPG. So that tells you, first of all, that smokers are going through metabolism more rapidly, making more 2,3-BPG. Why are they doing that? Well, there's a very good reason. When you smoke, you make a lot of carbon monoxide. Where do you get carbon monoxide? What happens when you get carbon monoxide with your hemoglobin? Oh, it binds and doesn't It binds and prevents oxygen from binding. So it's starting out at a disadvantage. The disadvantage being that it's already got some carbon monoxide there. Your hemoglobin capacity is lowered as a result of that. When your oxygen capacity goes down, the cell has got to burn more and more and more glucose just to get the same amount of energy. Make sense? Yes, sir. This may be a stretch, but is this why people that stop smoking say they add on weight? Or people that say they like, actually lose weight? So, <coughs> excuse me, his question was, is this why people, when they stop smoking, say they gain weight? Uh, there's probably a couple reasons. One is probably this. You probably are slowing down that process that's happening. The, probably the more important one, though, is most people report that food tastes a heck of a lot better after they stop smoking. 
because they're not getting all that crap on their on their tongues. Yes, sir. Didn't we say uh, uh, that BBG it didn't like it got back and it didn't let go the two three BBG and smokers? No, I just said that there was more of it in the bloodstream, okay. so it's getting it's more likely it's going to make up end up back in the lungs and therefore keep hemoglobin from binding more oxygen. Okay. So smokers have two things working against them, carbon monoxide and 2,3-BPG. Nasty combination. Yes, sir. What, what makes the process less efficient? Well, in this particular cell, yes. But what can happen is this can just go to another cell, another cell picks it up, and all of a sudden it's got a gift. right? So in the scheme of the body, it doesn't make it more uh, inefficient. In the, in the, inside of one cell, one cell is going to lose, another cell is going to gain. So in the overall process, there's not really a loss. Remember I said when it comes off, another cell picks it up and it metabolizes it, what's it going to do? It's going to grab it with this enzyme, and it's going to make this right here. OK, good question, though. Yes, Sue. That's right. Because if we let go of all of them, then we'd never get the rest of glycolysis. But the more of these we have going on, the more of this is going to release. Yes, Lynette. So, uh, other enzymes that don't typically Other enzymes do not typically. Some do. We'll talk about a couple. But most of them don't. OK. All right. So uh, that's what's going on there. Now, we're getting near the end, believe it or not. In the next reaction, 2-phosphoglycerate is converted into a very cool molecule called phosphoenolpyruvate, PEP. PEP has a lot of energy. When you have a lot of energy, you have PEP. That's kind of cool, right? A PEP rally, there you go. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called enolase. And you can see in this reaction that what's happening is a double bond is being created. The double bond is being created by the removal of water. It's, there's the water over there. This guy right here is loaded with energy. It's absolutely loaded with energy. We'll see what happens with that in the next reaction. Okay. The next reaction is the last reaction of the process we call glycolysis. And it's something I like to refer to as the Big Bang. We think of the Big Bang of the universe was the origin. I'm talking about the Big Bang of glycolysis being the last step of glycolysis. Why do I call it the Big Bang? Because PEP was so full of energy that it gave an, a phosphate to ADP and made ATP and still had a very, very energetic reaction, a very negative delta G0 prime. That means there's almost enough energy in PEP to make two ATPs. We don't make two ATPs. Instead, we simply release that excess energy as heat. Now, if you ever wonder why you get hot when you go running, now you know why. The reason you're getting hot is you're running reactions that are releasing heat every time they are going through the process. That's why your body heats up. That's why you sweat, is to try to cool your body down. You're making this. This, re this, reaction, is an, uh, this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called pyruvate kinase. Right there. It produces another ATP. It produces pyruvate, which you can call PYR if you want to. All right. And it's the reaction I call the Big Bang. OK. Is there a measure of how much heat is given off per reaction? The measure of heat that's given off is almost equivalent to the energy it takes to make an ATP. So that's why I say there's almost enough energy to make a second ATP in this reaction. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, since you showed the reactions of one-directional arrows, so how does pyruvate get back? Yeah. So no, uh, very good eyes here. I never noticed it myself. This one has a one-directional arrow. And the reason it has a one-directional arrow is this delta G0 prime is so negative, it takes like a million to one concentration to make it go backwards. That tells us that we can't make this go directly backwards. We have to use some tricks when we want to go the other direction. And I'll talk about that later, but very good observation.